Hello. I've had a couple of people asking me to record some thoughts and, and sort of advice, I suppose, really, um, for storytellers. Uh, and put out there some thoughts, not so much recording more stories, although I will do that at some point, <laughs> but more the kind of how to tell a story. Um, and given the number of people who've been asking, I suppose I really ought to get on with it and do it. So. Uh, I'm going to try and string a couple of brain cells together about that at the moment, although I'm not very very focused, a bit tired. It's that time of year of tons of marking at work when your brain just goes to, to mush after a while. Um, so this is going to be probably quite disjointed in that I'm stringing a number of ideas together. I might, I think, in uh, at some point um, in the coming month, sit down and go into some of these issues in more depth rather than just kind of skim over them, which is what I'm going to do. At the moment so I think probably first off I should start by saying that uh, storytelling in the context I'm talking about here is oral storytelling I've looked at a number of um, podcasts and things by uh, well-known people and uh, leading academics and what have you talking about storytelling and it, it seems to be that almost invariably either they're talking about script writing for films or TV and um, radio you know, that sort of storytelling uh, or they're talking about um, sociologists, anthropologists, people like that, recording the life stories of various people that they've interviewed um, in different contexts, and it's recording biographical tales. Possibly some of what I'm going to say could apply to some of those contexts too, but primarily I'm thinking in terms of storytelling as an oral tradition of practice telling myths, legends, folk tales, ghost stories, all of the, the, the kinds of things that I've um, recorded quite a lot of and put up on my um, blog and spent years and years and years traipsing around Ipswich and other places telling stories to you when you want daft enough to sit and listen to them. Um, so it's, it's that's the kind of storytelling I'm talking about, which for me I think has a slightly different context than the other styles of storytelling. Um, one of the issues that somebody asked me about, you know, what's your view on this, can you, can you say something about that, um, is to do with the purpose, the function of telling stories. Why do I do it? Why do other people do it? Well, no idea why other people do it. You'd have to ask other people. Um, well, I could take a wild guess, but you anyway. know, rather than trying to put words into other people's mouths, I'll tell you um, some of the reasons why I tell stories. Um, first and foremost, of course, is the very simple and uninspiring fact that I enjoy telling stories. Um, it's a chance to have an audience of people to talk to and, and um, people who, for a short period of time, <laughs> appear to be interested in what I'm talking about. So it's kind of, I dare say, a bit of attention seeking and what have you going on there, having people pay attention to you. But it's also quite a, a useful technique to get people to listen to you without having to um, disclose much of anything about myself because I am, as various people have noted, quite a private person. I don't particularly want to sit and talk about myself and I frequently find it quite dull when other people sit and talk about themselves. Because I'm an antisocial, borderline sociopath quite probably. But I love talking about things. Um, there is a, uh, one of the classes I teach, there is um, a, a subject touched upon this argument that, um, at least in the Western world, if not other parts of the world, um, women, when, when two or three or four women come together, they talk about themselves, they talk about each other, they talk about their lives, their children, their marriages, their jobs, you know, the, the stuff of life. When men come together, the argument is they talk about something else. Uh, and sometimes it's referred to as women having a face-to-face -face conversation where they're talking to each other, whereas men have a shoulder-to-shoulder -shoulder where they're not talking about each other or each other's lives and children and marriages and jobs and things. They come together and they talk about football or they talk about um, fixing the car or going fishing or politics or, or whatever it is. They, they talk about a thing, so they're engaging with each other without actually doing the face-to-face -face sharing bit. And you could argue that's somewhat what I'm doing. I'm not saying all oh, storytellers do that. But it's a chance to talk to people, to engage with people, um, without that kind of face-to-face -face disclosure. So the story is the thing that is being talked about, that is being engaged with. That's at an entirely uh, personal level. 
and I'm not suggesting for a minute that's a kind of unifying cultural practice with um, storytellers the world over. Because certainly, if, if we're thinking about storytelling in that kind of um, worldwide phenomena sense, if this is a thing that's gone on in every culture upon the face of the earth, there's been storytellers, uh, people regaling the myths, the legends, the histories, the folklore of their communities. That is a, a chief reason for doing it, both at a community level and you could argue at a personal level, in that the, the telling of stories is the creation of community. That someone sits and tells and other people sit and they listen and at least if the style of storytelling you're engaging in is similar to the one I do it's not passive audience active teller the you know, people in the audience they'll laugh they'll cry they'll joke they'll chuck out a rude comment every now and then they'll engage so it's an interaction between uh, teller and audience um, Joyce Grenfell who was a very entertaining British comedian who was very famous in the 60s and 70s and, uh, and a little beyond that um, used to do lots of kind of um, not, not impressions as such not, not of famous people or anything like that but she used to do sketches where she would imitate these the, the mannerisms of people she'd met and she'd kind of create these very convincing characters um, she said that each of her performances is an interaction between herself and the audience so even when she's doing the same sketch she's done a thousand times before each time it's different because the audience is different and the interreaction is different and that I think is very true of storytelling as well so even if I've told a particular myth or legend 20 times before to other people when I'm sitting down telling to this bunch of people the way I tell it is unique to them the interaction between me and them will be very um, specific unique to that group it's created in the moment so even though the story is one I'm very familiar with, maybe even one the audience themselves are very familiar with and have heard before. Each telling it becomes an original experience, a creation of community. Uh, and certainly if we're thinking historically, uh, uh, well, historically in this country, but still very much current in other parts of the world, where a village will have at least one, if not several, storytellers. And so you know, without TV and radio and such like things, the storyteller becomes a chief form of entertainment it goes beyond being a chief form of entertainment and it becomes a way for community to come together At the end of a long day's work they can sit down they can have something to eat something to drink uh, you know, warm themselves around the fire or these at this day and age radiators um, and they can listen and they can forget about their cares and their woes and how their back aches and how their hands are calloused from being in the fields or whatever it is and that they can just be with each other and tell a tale or listen to a tale they can share they can laugh they can cry they, they can ooh and ah all together they have that kind of collective experience it creates community if you do it on a regular basis obviously if it's a performance some you know, let's say in this country you've got professional storytellers they book a venue they turn up you buy a ticket you hear a story you don't really know who they are you may never see them again there's not much of a, an ongoing community in that kind of one-off experience of storytelling. But at its heart, storytelling never was a one-off experience. It was something um, to be regularly engaged in. And it becomes, or became, past ends in this country, a way of drawing communities together. I, I suppose to some extent you could argue television has kind of taken on that role and, and, and well, maybe not quite so much radio these days but certainly in the past in that you know uh, sort of people all over the country could watch the same tv program they could watch that like, soap opera or doctor who or, or uh, medical drama or whatever it is that they're watching and then talk about it with each other the, the next day or uh, facebook each other about it or whatever and they have the story and they engage with each other about whether they liked it or hated it or did they, you know, what's going to happen next with the cliffhanger and all that kind of business. So perhaps you could argue that we've sort of shifted away from the um, individualism of the oral storyteller to the um, collective effort of the, the televised program or, or the film or um, the stage play or what have you as a means of telling a tale that brings people together. Um, at the risk of sounding a little bit like um, 
Talcott Parsons, who's an American sociologist, who talked about the way in which various different practices and activities are reinforcers of social norms. You can argue storytelling, whether it is the, the old fashioned sitting around the campfire hearing a story, or whether it's watching something on TV serves that function of reinforcing social norms as well. It tells people about their history. Awful lot of storytelling, folklore, legends, myths, um, is it tales from the collective history of a particular group of people. And so each new generation learns the tales anew. They're not presented as, as dull, dreary things in a history book that sends people to sleep in school, but rather as a living, exciting, energising story that people are listening to and engaging with. It gives a sense of who we are. You know, we are the heroes in the story, and those other people over there who did those dreadful things, they're the baddies, they're the villains. You know, those Second World War films of you know, the Nazis are the baddies, and we're the good guys, and, and the Americans came in eventually, and, and all of that sort of thing. So it's, it's identifying who we are and who other people are, and how we relate to them because of things that probably happened before either the storyteller or anyone in the audience was born. But it creates that sense of continuity of identity, continuity of culture. What's appropriate, what's not appropriate, what's admirable, what's um, despicable. Uh, there, there's lots of traditions of you know, stories like um, Jenny Greenteeth, who is a mad hag, uh, who lives in, in um, boggy, swampy areas in the folklore up north. Um, back in the day, telling children stories about Jenny Greenteeth was a good way of, of scaring them off of going to dangerous marshes and getting too near the river. So rather than just saying, don't go near the river, you're falling and drown, which is a bit prosaic, it's putting the, the, the mad hank will get you and she'll eat you and she'll chew your bones and suck the marrow out, which is a damn sight scarier for small children than just the threat of falling in a river and drowning. So it's it serves a practical purpose. It's a way of warning people, whether it's small children being warned off of going too near to a dangerous river, or whether it's warning people off of um, undesirable antisocial perverse behaviour, telling them what constitutes perverse behaviour in the first place. So there is that sort of didactic element to storytelling, which you can argue, if, if we're thinking the, the ethics of storytelling, is worth thinking about as the teller of the story, in, in the sense of what values do you want to convey to your audience? Um, do you is it, do you want to warn them off of doing something that you genuinely believe to be dangerous? Um, I suppose in this day and age, you could argue uh, people sharing their stories of you know, their child got vaccinated and their head fell off, or some equally bizarre thing as a way of warning people against the ooh, the dangers of vaccination, or warning them in favour. Like, you want in favour, but anyway, um, encouraging them in favour of vaccination. So um, Roald Dahl tells the story um, of how his daughter, uh, who back a long time ago before vaccinations were commonplace, um, became severely ill and died of something that a decade or two later she could have been vaccinated against. And uh, a lot of his stories were um, things like Matilda and so on where you've got the, the main um, character is a little girl. To a large extent, that's him recollecting his daughter, this kind of uh, what if, you know, if, if she'd grown, if this, if that, if the other. So the, the memory of his daughter, and when he tells the story of how she died, um, that that's a, has a didactic element to it. It's saying you, you should get your children um, vaccinated because this is what happens if you don't. So it's, there's all kinds of levels of, of teaching about you know, health, um, how to have a good marriage, how to have, avoid a bad marriage, um, friendship, bravery, courage, dishonesty, crime, all manner of things can be conveyed and taught in storytelling uh, and done so in a way that's much more engaging than just some boring old fool standing up in a pulpit and giving a very dull finger-wagging sermon about something. The storytelling is, is a sort of a sermon, I suppose you could argue, but it's done in a way that's meant to be engaging. And you could, of course, think, do you, in terms of your didactic role as a storyteller, do you just want to tell people, don't do this because, or you really ought to do that because, 
Or do you want to pose it as a question? This might happen. What do you as the audience think? Are you there to deliver information? Are you there to provoke thought, reflection and debate? Or a bit of both? There's nothing wrong with either of those approaches. You can kind of integrate both. Um, one of the other uh, questions that was, was asked by someone was around um, cultural appropriation, which is one of these subjects that is a cause of obsession with the social justice movement these days, which must be one of the tedious bloody political movements on the planet. However, um, cultural appropriation can be understood in a number of different ways. And I don't want to go over them all because that really would get quite monotonous. But um, one, of, one of the key issues is the idea of a, an individual from a culture that has historically, in the past, done something quite dreadful to another culture that's suffering because of whatever was done in the past. And kind of picking bits out of that culture, taking them and walking away with them, um, benefiting from them without giving anything back. And there are some good arguments to be made around why that can be a genuine problem, uh, particularly a problem for people who feel that their culture is being nicked by someone who is descended from uh, someone or other who helped to destroy a large swathe of their culture in the first place. I imagine, I've never been in that position myself, but I imagine it would be quite galling to experience that sort of a thing. Um, but unfortunately, it kind of gets overplayed and overplayed as social media gets involved in politics and people get hyped up about things they don't need to get hyped up about. Can a storyteller engage in cultural appropriation? So in other words, can you nick a story from someone else, somebody else's culture? I'm not talking about plagiarism of claiming a book is your book when in fact somebody else wrote it. But... Um, retelling a story that you have no right to retell. That, I think, is a very problematic idea because it rather assumes a sense of ownership over stories. When it comes to a, a sort of um, nosology, a sort of classification of stories, on what you might say well, this is a, a Chinese story or this is a Roman myth or this is a, a Hindu um, epic, you might describe stories in that way, you give them a sense of labelling, a sense of... Um, where this comes from, but that's shorthand, fundamentally, for ease of telling, and it's not necessarily always overtly accurate, um, the labels that are, uh, are given. Um, and if you say uh, th this is a Japanese story, some people might interpret that as meaning this story is somehow owned by Japanese people. And I think you're opening up a really weird and dodgy can of worms if you imply that a story is owned by anyone. Because there could be a whole raft of people in, in Japan who've never heard that Japanese story before, so in what sense do they own it? Um, and if someone who is not Japanese tells a story, does this mean that they are somehow encroaching upon Japanese culture? If you're going to go down that route, then you're almost saying that people can only tell stories of the culture from which they come. So just as the, the um, white British person can't tell the Japanese story, does that equally mean the Japanese person can't tell the, the white British story? That they couldn't possibly tell the story of Robin Hood because that would be cultural appropriation too, which is getting nonsensical when you get to that level. And how far do you want to carry it? Do we want to turn around and say, uh, you know, people who live in Suffolk can't possibly tell the folklore of Essex because it's appropriating it? How far down that line do you want to go? It starts to get ridiculous. What you can say, I think, with more reason and more validity, is that there is a room for cultural understanding, and an equally cultural misunderstanding, that um, when you're telling a story from a foreign culture, if you're not particularly familiar, you've just opened a book at random and told the first story out of it, um, or learned the first story out of it, then you wouldn't necessarily understand the nuances, the subtleties, the symbolism, the imagery. See my legs are hurting at the moment. <laughs> it comes from sitting on the floor too much. You wouldn't necessarily get the ins and outs of that um, story. If you're just telling it, I don't know, um, 
to two or three shreds, and I'm, I'm sure that doesn't really matter in the long run. However, if you're booking out the Albert Hall and telling that story to a couple of thousand people and charging them tickets for the privilege, then you could well argue that maybe it is beholden on you to get your finger out and learn that story properly, rather than just sort of give a half-assed version of the story where you don't really get it, you don't really understand half of it, and you're putting it across in a, a way that someone who is very familiar with that story might find annoying or, or confusing because they're, they're sitting there listening to you and thinking, well, you've got that wrong, or you've totally missed the point of that thing, or, or well, you just made that bit up, that bit never happened in the story. So there, there, there comes a room that if you are, I think, profiting rather than just telling for fun, if you're profiting from the story because you're selling tickets, mildly, then you do need to make an effort to learn how to pronounce foreign names. If it's a, a story from a language that's not your own language, you make an effort to really get get into the story, to understand it, to grasp the meaning, the significance, and how you want to put that story across. It, it also opens up some issues that apply not just at a cultural level but in other contexts. That um, a story can be understood in a dozen different ways. As a storyteller. Is there an official way the story should be understood, or is it fair game if you want to take a story and read into it something that was probably never there in the first place, or at least is severely debatable whether it was very ever there in the first place? Um, yeah, let, let's say you've got uh, a passionate conviction in something, Marxism, feminism. Um, Capitalism, some I mean, neoliberalism, some you've got some cause, maybe a political one or a religious one or whatever it may be, and that colours your lens of how you see the world very, very strongly. So there you are. Um, or to take a very obvious example, um, the, the Little Red Riding Hood story has been done to death by about a, a thousand different authors now, but one of the more entertaining, at least I, I found it um, sort of entertaining. Uh, uh, versions of the Little Red Riding Hood story was um, presented in a film, The Company of Wars, which itself is based on a book um, which has very feminist uh, reading of, of the myth. So Little Red Riding Hood is, is influenced by people like um, Susanna Budapest and various other uh, very, very feminist writers. Um, she's a young, obviously in the, in the original story, she is a young girl, that's, that's part of the core message, but the, the interpretation is that she's on the edge of puberty. And the, the getting the red hood, that's a metaphor for her, for make, her first menstruation, and um, there she is sort of entering into adulthood, entering into womanhood, and the wolf she meets in the way, that becomes a, a, a metaphor for the louche, um, men that she's going to encounter, which um, in Perrault's, Charles Perrault's uh, book, which is one of the very first ones to record the story of the Red Rider, but is very much present in that story. And he says, you know, this, is, this is a warning to nice and nice young ladies to beware of, of the wolves in the court, the, these louche men who will seduce them and then discard them and, and, and rob them of their virtue and all that sort of thing. So, um, even in the Company of Wolves, the film, which which reinterprets it in, in, in werewolf imagery, it's very, very engaging film, um, that is heightened from the original pro uh, version of the story. Uh, except in the film, spoilers, um, the wolf turns out to be not half as bad as the kind of characters that Poe was warning against, and Red Riding Hood runs off with him, and it's... Um, uh, sort of, he becomes a werewolf, and she runs off into the wilds as well, and it's all a bit sort of uh, dreamlike and surreal towards the end. So it it takes the original Poe story and kind of goes off into different directions with it, gives it a very feminist spin, uh, a very sexual, very eroticized spin. There's all sorts of other um, subtext going into it. Um, is that fair game? Bringing in modern day politics, modern day interests, or do we get all very, um, well, you know, puritanical, I suppose, and say, oh no, you, you've got to stick to the original reading, you can't bring in 
political meanings. You can't bring in um, meanings that deal with gender or sexuality or this or that or the other. Or do we just have a kind of an open field day in which anything can be interpreted in any particular way? And I've no idea what the answer is to that one. But I'm just kind of putting it out there as a question. Um, I avoided getting drawn into a Facebook conversation because it, it was going in directions that I thought I'd just end up getting frustrated and fed up um, of an interpretation of the the Dayweth story, one of the Welsh myths um, about a woman who is ultimately transformed at the end of the story into an owl. Um, uh, there's adultery and all sorts of th themes in the myth. The, the, the transformation into the owl in the um, standard reading of the story is a punishment for having cheated on the husband and almost succeeded in murdering him and various other shenanigans that were going on. Um, the the uh, social media conversation that I avoided getting into was somebody was saying, oh, I think this is a rape story, this is rape culture, and going down that way and bringing in very, very, very modern 21st century concerns and convictions to read into a story that in written format dates back um, over 500 years and probably in oral format goes back much longer than that and I, I, I felt they were reading into something as a sacred story what was very very much their own personal political views and hang-ups and that's kind of where you could argue things start to get murky because some stories are sacred to certain people Religious stories, um, cultural icons and heroes have a, a tremendous significance to certain people. And, and if somebody else comes along and reads into it something very negative perhaps, then that might hugely offend the person to whom it is a, a sort of a, well, I was going to say sacred cow, that's a really dodgy turn of phrase to use in this context, but... Um, it has great significance to them and they don't like the negative reading that this other person has placed upon it. Does that story belong to one person and not to the other? Does it belong to everyone? And if one person sees it positively and another sees it in the most scathing of terms, it's all equally fair game to everyone? It's a difficult one to, de to debate. Uh, I was at a um, storytelling event a fair few years ago now, in which somebody told a myth, um, a Norse myth about various gods and goddesses getting up to thing, and aside from that, they, they weren't the best teller in the world, but that's, that's kind of not terribly relevant. Um, they used some quite strong language um, to describe one of the goddesses, quite rude language, and somebody in the audience who was a, a uh, a heathen, a, a, dev a devotee of those deities, um, felt that it had gone too far, and that the, the person telling the story was not a, not a pagan or a heathen or anything like that. That to them it was just a story. So the story had no sacred context to the teller, but it did to somebody. Uh, uh, well, several people actually in the audience, one of whom was sufficiently offended to comment on the fact after the story had finished and was over, uh, and to feel that this person had, had overstepped the boundary and said something that was just uncalled for. Um, and again, that's the sense of, as the teller, understanding your audience, going back to Joyce Grenfell and the kind of um, interaction between audience and teller, and maybe a, a, a sign that that particular teller was inexperienced because they didn't understand their audience, they didn't grasp the fact um, which they should have done, given the nature of the event, uh, <laughs> some people in the audience would have held the figures in those stories in very, very high regard and not wanted that kind of language to be used about them. There's an element of ownership there, perhaps. But then the alternative argument, I suppose, would be that a story is a story. It's all common property to the whole of humanity, whether we're talking Norse myths, Japanese stories, um, tales of the Inuit, or some ghost story I made up last Thursday, and as soon as I tell it and put it out there um, in the public, it becomes public property. It's, it has no 
copyright upon it at that stage and therefore anyone can hear it and learn it and retell it with whatever spin they want to put on it, good, bad or otherwise there's a spin to put on it. Can they subvert the meaning as well? Clearly they can. I suppose the ethical question is, should they subvert the meanings of a story? Give it some new interpretation, some new spin, put their own politics on it, their own religious spin on it, whatever else, um, and do with it as they damn well please, and if other people get upset, well, tough luck. Or do you exercise a degree of, yeah, what can we say, sensitivity to other people and think, well, I might not find this story particularly important or particularly sacred, but I know the people at the, the back of the auditorium who are listening to this do, therefore I will tread carefully and not go out of my way to offend them or upset them. Some people, of course, are offended by absolutely every bloody thing that's said to them and indeed make an entire career out of being prof professionally offended on a regular basis. So that could be carried way too far by someone who is being offended by stuff they really don't need to be offended about. And you can't keep using the fence as a, a stick to beat other people into silence and, and to censor them with. Um, there are some forms of offence where you can say, well, hey, yeah, fair enough, I can understand why you're offended and that other person needs to be a little bit more um, you know, sensible with how they open their mouth in the future. But other times, people just get carried away with the, the wish to be offended, day and night. So I, I don't think you can always use the, the concern of offence as a reason not to say something. If the interpretation of that story is a, a fair and valid one, or even you, you just want to experiment with it and, and see, does it work as a story? Just because something is fair and valid it doesn't mean, necessarily mean it always works as a story which rather ramblingly brings to another point um, i'm not the most pc person in the world but i have tried to tell stories that will integrate different points of view that don't often get heard um, i've for example tried to well not retell existing folklore um, but to take inspiration from existing folklore to create similar sorts of stories in the in the tradition of, if you like, um, but integrating gay characters. Uh, other people could do, you know, will have similar experiences trying to integrate other types of, of character, but characters that the kind of characters that you'd very rarely hear about in the majority of um, medieval or earlier folklore for example, and I wanted to see if I could weave in other things. And in all honesty, those stories were just crap. <laughs> they really were crap. Um, the, 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 the um, what can we say, gaying them up or whatever term you want to use, um, it just felt really forced and, and clunky and it just didn't flow well. Any of those, well, there's about three, three, four stories I've done in that. None of them flowed particularly well or felt good as stories. And I'm still in my own mind working on how to make them better. How can I overcome? Why do they feel so clunky? Why do they feel so kind of, I don't know, cheesy and badly done? Um, to progress to a point where I can tell those stories and they'll feel good, they'll feel better. They'll, they'll just flow better as stories. So it, it's, I, I'm not giving up on the idea of doing those stories, I'm just kind of you know, trying to polish them to get them better, and it's proving a challenge. Um, yeah, it's like perhaps a lot of um, films and things recently, you know, TV shows and what have you, that have taken a, a traditional format and put a change into it to make a political statement, turn a male character into a female character, um, a white character or a black character, what have you, they'll make changes and say, well, you, you know, this is the new um, cutting edge version of this story. And we've made changes to give uh, say representation to a group of people who are not normally represented in this way. It's particularly difficult if you do that with an existing format, whether we're talking a film, a film or a myth or a legend or what have you. Um, yeah, as opposed to creating a new story featuring the kind of character you want to, to feature, that, that's different from taking an existing story and making a significant change. 
because again you get into issues of ownership and people listening to that story and watching the a film saying oh when I saw that I've seen this this story a thousand times before and that character has always been a woman or that character has always been a Mijito or whatever the thing is and now you've changed it to make it something else why? a fairly valid question to ask um, but it is, it is that difficulty of creating new stories that work well uh, particularly if you're I suppose you think you're, you're just churning out soap operas or something dreary but if you're trying to work in the style of a traditional myth, folk tale, legend, something that flows in a particular way, that's that's a harder um, kind of milieu to work in to change. Uh, ought it be done? Should a story be told because the story is good, as opposed to it being worthy? And we've got a ticker box. We've got to have a story with this kind of character, a story with that kind of character. We've got to have a story that makes this issue, that highlights that point. Is that why those stories become crap? Because they're missing the whole point that a story should be told because it's a good story, not because it tick boxes certain features and appeases certain agendas. And maybe when people like me try to make it appease a certain agenda, it just comes out really rubbish. Maybe that is a, a, a point to mull over and... and reflect on or maybe I'm just not particularly good at telling those types of stories and maybe some of these script writers are not particularly good at writing certain types of stories could well be um, last point I finish on because I've just noticed how long I've been rambling on for this is kind of returning to a slightly earlier point about the, the creation of community and joining people together as they sit in an audience and they sit with the storyteller and it's this sort of interaction between everyone and, and creating that sense of community that does come back to this this uh, I hate that word representation issue in that the community that is created is not just the audience and the teller it's also the figures in the story so figures in this sense I mean in a very broad way the characters the places um, if it's a myth the, the gods the monsters the creatures the the, the the weird and the wonderful that appear in the story. It binds everyone in the story, in the audience, and on the, the stage or the chair or whatever it is that the storyteller is occupying. All of them come together, which is why it can be argued if, if there are certain parts of the community that are never allowed into the audience and never allowed into the stories, is it a, ultimately a, a kind of unwittingly deliberate exclusion? And does that need to be tackled? But then again, how do you do it? Why it well, that opens up a can of worms in itself as to how you can get that to go well. Um, from a, a religious point of view, telling stories about um, God's ancestors, the mystical side of it, brings those beings into the minds of the listeners. It brings them into the presence of the listeners or brings the listeners into the presence of the beings, depending on how you look at that. Um, and it enables, it helps, it assists in creating links and bonds. Just as if you tell a story of a particular place, that woodland down the road, or that, that ancient building on the top of the hill over there, you know, whatever it may be. Hearing stories about a place, not just once, maybe many times, helps to create a sense of linkage between the audience, the teller, and the place. If you know the tales of a place, and those tales could be family anecdotes, you know, that's, that's the, um, the oak tree under which my great-great-grandfather proposed marriage to my great-great-grandmother, which is more of an anecdote than anything. Um, or it could be folklore, that, that castle on the top of the hill that's haunted, and, and this happened, that happened, some other thing happened there, and a whole raft of stories associated with that place. It creates a sense of bonding, a sense of linkage, a sense of this place is part of my life. One of the practical impacts of that, of course, is that you then feel a sense of um, protectiveness as an audience and a teller to that place. So if the place is threatened, uh, you know, the, the council want to chop down that woodland and build a housing estate there, or the, the castle on the top of the hill catches fire, 
um, something happens to threaten or, or harm or damage the place, you feel protective towards it and you maybe are more inclined to chain yourself to the, the trees to stop the bulldozers demolishing them or contribute money or time or effort towards the rebuilding of the castle that's burned down than you would be if you didn't know any stories of that place and you felt no particular link to it. So the, the stories create a sense of belonging. And if it is places that you can walk to, you know, places in your immediate neighbourhood, then it gives you, you as a listener or a teller a sense of belonging in your neighbourhood. You are there in the geographic community as well as in the human community of the place. So if you have none of those stories, do you really have links? Do you really have a sense of belonging, a sense of place, a sense of purpose? Or do you become, what can we say, adrift in some sense? So I think part of the storytelling is, uh, and, and you know, kind of going back to the issue of which stories you choose to tell, you could choose to tell local stories, you could choose to tell stories with the intention of trying to encourage linking between people and places or between people and people by telling this group of people stories about that group of people in the nicest possible sense in the word of stories or telling them their history their legends their folklore to create a sense of bringing two groups of people together um, whether those two groups of people are geographically distant um, whether they are um, just kinds of people that don't encounter each other very often across social divides, you have the stories of the very rich and the very poor, stories of um, the very old and the very young, or whatever, groups who maybe in some societies don't interact very much. Learning each other's stories might bring them more closely together. And, and so you could do a little, little bit of social engineering, which is a dreadful idea, but you could do it anyway, um, of trying to bring peoples together, as well as bring people and places together, by sharing the tales, sharing the stories. And obviously, some of this kind of depends on, on the um, the nature of the of the event at which stories are told. Some events you go along, you've no idea what stories you're going to going to be told. You just sit there, and the storyteller will choose to tell you whatever stories they think about. So they're exercising a degree of choice, and and part of that may be simply which story can I remember in the first place. Uh, but it also could be that they're, they're thinking, oh, I want to tell this story because I want it to have this effect. I want the, the audience to know about this thing or to know about that thing. So there, there is that kind of element in which the storyteller is trying to create a certain effect on the audience by selecting stories. There are other events you go to where it's more you know, shouting out requests to the DJs kind of thing, where the, story, the audience says, oh, can you tell us the story about that? Or, oh, please tell us the story about so-and-so thing. There are other events where maybe the storyteller is hired in, like a charity event, a fate, a fair, something like that. And it's whoever's hiring the storyteller in who says, we would like you to tell stories about X, Y, and Z to the audience. So somebody else is making the choice as to which tales get heard and which tales don't. So there's all sorts of different levels as to who is choosing what. Um, different ethics come into that kind of who's making a decision, what, what are the thought processes going on in their heads about why they want this story or why why we shouldn't tell that kind of story because it's not appropriate or it's boring or it's too long, too short, too this, too that, too the other. And a, a process of choice is going on in the selection of the stories that will be heard or won't be heard, as the case may be. Um, last bit I'll leave you with, I promise. Uh, in sociology, there's this idea of standpoint theory, uh, which is used to argue that um, if you're conducting research on something you are familiar with and part of, you speak from within. You, you, you have a, stand, a point of view, a, point, a standpoint, in which you understand the topic you're talking about in a way that someone who is not part of it, has no experience of it, wouldn't necessarily understand. And people like Nancy Arstock, yeah, used it to argue that when she was um, around and, and writing about this idea, there weren't that many female sociologists. So it tended to be men writing about things that were of interest to men and researching into things that were of interest to men. Very few women researching things that were of interest to them. And so she said, well, you know, as this changes, we, we could hear more about the female standpoint in terms of sociology. And that, that idea 
point of view argument has been used in not just sociology, but all sorts of other areas of research and, and study and, and writing and creativity as well, to, to kind of bring out the idea that um, how a story is understood, it could be stories about things in your own life, so you can not actually tell people anecdotes from your own life, because that could be dreadfully dull, but tell them things that are part of your cultural background, part of where you come from, part of... of um, what you've been through in life, which was somehow sort of shape and colour and flavour the story. So the way you put it across could be very different from the way somebody else who doesn't have that cultural background would put that story across. Uh, and that's a thing worth bearing in mind. Don't you? Are you present in your stories? Should you be? Or are there times when you should kind of be more of a cipher and putting those stories across in a, a neutral way? Um, so stories from your culture versus just general stories from around the world in general. So not a general, in that sense. Um, it could also influence uh, the flavouring of a story. So it's become quite a number of authors over the last few decades have written novels and plays and so on, taking traditional themes, well-known stories, well-known stage plays, and retelling them from the point of view of somebody other than the original main character in the original telling of the story. Um, so, uh, uh, um, I forget the name of the author off the top but there was a, a retelling of the story of Jekyll and Hyde from the point of view of the housemaid. It's actually quite a good book. It doesn't sound it bad, stories of housemaids, but it was actually quite a, a interesting telling of how, how the housemaid come to realise that nice old Dr. Jekyll was also the same person as that dreadful Mr. Hyde who came in doing awful terrible things in the, the laboratory at the end of the garden. So you could choose to tell a myth, a story, a legend, a tale that is well known and popular, but tell it from a different standpoint, a different character, rather than the, the sort of either the neutral voice of the, the storyteller as a fly on the wall, or some stories which are very much centred on certain main characters. What would it look like from a different character's point of view. Do you as the storyteller try to become, sort of act out the character that you're, you, whose story you're telling, whose viewpoint you are expressing? Um, that can open up some interesting uh, experiences that as a storyteller you can start thinking about the world from a very different kind of point of view. How well do you do it? How easily do you get into the head of a character who's maybe very different from you in some significant way? Um, Sometimes it could be argued, ought you do it in the first place? Because if you don't do it very well, maybe that could come across poorly in the story, that sort of thing. But as, as a way of living that story from different stances, different experiences, uh, that's perhaps something that needs more um, reflecting on and debating this, this idea of the story as a lived experience, that the teller can get their head into a story and it can change the storyteller as well as sometimes be inspirational or thought-provoking or happy for the audience experiencing the story and get them thinking from different stances, different points of views, understanding the world from other people's perspectives. Something to mull over, something to, th to think about. But I, I've rambled on way, way longer than I actually initially intended to. Um, I'll, I'll see what the kind of response to this is. People might be more interested in some aspects than they are in others, and then when I get onto a second or third uh, video recording with Meander, I'll, I'll, I'll kind of leapfrog off the back of the feedback to see what to give more attention to on and what to equally forget about is something that no one's really interested in. Um, so any, any kind of feedback would be helpful if you would like to know more. If you would not like to know more about any of it, then fair enough. But hopefully it's been reasonably useful and reasonably thought-provoking um, and maybe by next time I'll be slightly more focused and able to give a more coherent insight into some of these issues. <laughs>